you. Hello, hello everyone, welcome. It's good to see you all. Um, so let's kick this off. Uh, welcome to the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University and welcome to those joining online through our YouTube channel. Thanks for adjusting the lights. Uh, my name is Sara Codarini and I'm an assistant professor of architecture at the college. At the college, we believe that the future of design is multidisciplinary and we host a range of design degrees that include graphic design, product design, transportation design, game design, interiors, and architecture. We track design future trends, emerging technologies, and advancements in practice as a means of crafting education approaches in these areas. Our lecture series allows us to engage in design discussions and offer broad perspectives on where we are headed. In the last year, we have seen an incredible increase in the use of AI related to design. This new te technology led us to pitch an idea for the exhibition to be held during the Detroit Month of Design. We launched an international call for visions of the future of urban mobility in Detroit and received over a thousand AI-generated images from 22 countries. The exhibition is called Mobile Detroit 2050, opens today and will be up for a month in the UTLC gallery, room T210. So you guys are all invited to check it out. Uh, September 22nd, uh, you can see that uh, on the flyers uh, as well on your seats, there will be a panel discussion about the work. Today's guest lecturer has been working on AI for a while, giving presentations and publishing extensively on the topic. So we thought it would be perfect to have Matthias Del Campo today kick off our show opening and also our fall 2023 co-ed lecture series. Dr. Matthias Del Campo is an architect, designer, and educator. He's an associate professor at Amman College for Architecture and Urban Planning, University of Michigan, director of the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Lab at U of M. He conducts research on advanced design methods in architecture primarily through the application of artificial intel intelligence techniques in collaboration with the Computer Science Department and Michigan Robotics. Matthias Del Campo is the co-founder of the Architecture Practice Pan. Their award-winning architectural designs are informed by advanced geometry, computational methodologies, and philosophical inquiry. Span gained wide <laughs> recognition <laughs> Uh, for the design of the Austrian Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai World Expo, and more recently for the Robo Garden at the Ford Robotics Building. Spence's work was featured at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2012, 2021, Archilab 2013, and the Architecture Biennale in Vienna and Buenos Aires in 2019. I hope I got all the numbers right. <laughs> Matthias Del Campo was awarded the Accelerate, uh, Accelerate CERN Fellowship, the AIA Studio Prize, and was elected into the Board of Directors of Acadia and the International Journal of, of Architectural Computing. Solo shows include formations at the MAC in Vienna and the exhibition Sublime Bodies at the Fab Union Gallery in Shanghai, China. 2013, SPAN expanded its operations to Shanghai, China, where the practice is currently working on building projects of various scales. He earned his Master of Architecture from the University of Applied Arts Vienna and his PhD from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, so today, Matthias will speak on tect tectonics of the Latin space, designing with artificial intelligence. And at the end of the lecture, we'll have time for a 15 minute Q&A session. So that's it. So the floor is yours. Please help me welcome Matthias. Okay, I hope people online can hear me now. And I'm gonna also turn on this mic here. Can you hear me? Hello, yeah? yeah? Awesome, thank you. Thanks for confirming. Sarah, thank you so much for the generous introduction, long-winded and really in-depth 
so I appreciate this very much. Um, uh, there's uh, actually normally I start with, yes, my name is Matthias Del Campo and I'm a professor of architecture at Dublin College, but all of this was said and done, so we can go right into the middle of everything, which is a lecture on the tectonics of the Latin space, designing with artificial intelligence. So one thing I want to point out is that um, um, I'm not going to explain in, in long what tectonics is and not what Latin space is. It's going to be primarily about uh, ideas and concepts and possibilities of using artificial intelligence in architecture design. And the majority of the ideas and concepts that I'm presenting today, I put together in this book called Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence, which was sort of like a first attempt to understand uh, artificial intelligence, not necessarily only as a tool of expediency, of optimization and things like this, but understanding also what it means culturally as a cultural tool for architectural production. At the end of the day, artificial intelligence is a tool, right? Don't think of it as, a, as an intelligent machine that's gonna take over the world, it's gonna kill you or things like this. This is all science fiction fantasies that are not true. It's a tool. It, the only big difference to tools we used before is that it is a tool that can learn. And this is something that is a novelty to everyone involved in doing this sort of research. Neural architecture in itself is a field of architecture that is primarily preoccupied with interrogating the emergent field of artificial neural networks uh, as a method of designing architecture. Artificial neural networks can be described in short as a sequence of mathematical algorithms that are capable of registering latent correlations in a set of data. So in this lecture, I present a, a, an attempt, I would say, to utilize deep learning and machine learning to capture the salient features of existing architecture in order to interrogate this data for their underlying architectural qualities. And you can ask yourself, what is meant by architectural qualities, right? I mean, you can, and you can uh, look at this from two sides, yeah? On the one side, the part of really the pragmatic, practical things that you need to do in architecture, and on the other side, what does it mean as an aspect that, com that contributes to human culture? But before we continue, I think we have to ask a very simple question first, which is why use AI at all? So there is actually a sort of a short explanation uh, of, or a short answer to this, why use AI? Because it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. It's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. Like, what do I mean by that? I'm sure you have seen videos like this one before. Uh, the, the way of how cars, and being in Detroit is perfect actually to show this example, how cars were, did, were made until the late 1960s and early 70s. It was expert knowledge that was applied to particular parts of the assembly process of the car. You had these people who knew exactly how to weld cars, how to paint cars, how to assemble elements together, and so on and so forth. It was actually General Motors who introduced the first robot to an assembly line. Uh, in 1963, if I'm not entirely wrong, the robot was called Unimate and was put in an assembly line in New Jersey uh, to work. And what developed out of it is what we see here, which is basically, uh, instead of having experts putting together or, or welding together cars, we have pre-programmed sequences of robots that are uh, programmed to uh, um, repeatedly pre uh, repeat the same uh, procedure over and over again, right? Putting together these cars. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the part where it becomes east interesting for artificial intelligence research or for neural networks is that um, the car industry has collected over the last 60 plus years that I've been using car, uh, the, the robots on an assembly line, millions and millions of data points about welding points in space, right? So they have this enormous treasure trove of data there that would actually allow them, instead of reprogramming an assembly line over and over again for every new model that they have to make, basically to go ahead and say, well, I can actually now teach a robot, not necessarily the specific welding points of a specific car model, but what it means to weld. Yeah? What it means to weld well. It can learn how to weld. Meaning that this assembly line can stay the same, right? What changes is that every single car that comes along that assembly line can be different. Which means that there's no retraining, there's a, uh, you know, uh, saving costs, et cetera, et cetera. 
you create this sort of responsive work environment where the machine understands a task that is fairly complex uh, to, to, to apply, right? Okay, so this is like sort of a more technical thing, like data is important, lots of data is important to make a machine learn anything. Now for a completely different area of interrogation, which is the cultural dimension of this, uh, which I call the rise of neural art, because those things actually started to emerge around 2018, I would say, when you have probably seen this painting before. Uh, this is um, the portrait of Bertrand de Bellamy uh, by the Paris-based um, uh, art collective Obvious, which was put on um, auction in 2018 and sold for about half a million dollars. And this was, this was quite, uh, it really made a splash, yeah, because no one expected, first of all, that an AI-generated artwork will make that much money. But more interesting than how much money it made is the fact that it started to uh, raise questions in art circles yeah, immediately about, for example, agency. Who actually did this artwork? Yeah? About sensibility. Does it mean that AI can create a novel sort of sensibility in the arts? about authorship. Again, like who did this piece of art? Was it the artists who came up with the idea to use a neural network to do a piece of art? Or is the author the programmer who put together the algorithm for the neural network? Or is the author the thousands or maybe sometimes millions of artists that are present in the data set that was used to train this neural network to create this piece of art? This is completely unclear until now, until today. And most likely, it never will be completely cleared up. Uh, which means probably that we have to abandon certain ideas of authorship today. Uh, so uh, around, the around the same time, there were other artists who came to, be, who came to, uh, to, to work in this area. People like Mario Klingemann, uh, Holly Herndon, um, uh, uh, Sofia Crespo. And sometimes it's also musicians like Yacht, Dadabot. So it started to really impact the whole variety of different art fields around the world. Not only uh, the visual arts, but also literature, music, and so on and so, on and so forth. Uh, so there was like a whole explosion of the use of ideas coming from AI within the art fields. Uh, Mario Klingemann for me is specifically an interesting artist um, because he, uh, first of all, he really knows how to program or to script, let me put it that way, he knows how to script. He created his own neural networks at the beginning of, of his career. Uh, and what, I, uh, what I'm interested in his work are aspects of estrangement and defamiliarization that are visible in his work. I'm gonna talk about the estrangement and defamiliarization in a second after I show you work that we did around the same time in 2018 which was basically put together data sets of, for example, in this case, Gothic architecture and playing with things like uh, StyleGun, the first StyleGun version that came out around that time. Uh, it was very explorative work, just trying to understand like what does it do, how does it do it, why does it do it? I'm not even sure today that I know that already, but, but the asking of those questions became relevant in terms of understanding how it impacts our work as architects. And some of the questions that came out of that also included things like becoming aware that data sets also include racial bias, right? That, uh, for example, if I do a Gothic data set or Gothic architecture data set, it is of course biased towards Western art, obviously, or architecture, right? The problem becomes even more visible when the data sets become larger, like in large language models and also in the image generators that probably all of you are using and we also see in the exhibition here. Because the larger the data set becomes, the more, in the, 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 the more it has a tendency towards racial biases, cultural biases, and gender biases. Yeah? It's, it got a little bit better recently, I have to say. It was very bad about two years ago. Uh, literally two years ago, if you randomly put, if you use, for example, the diffusion model like Midjourney, and you type in a random letter number sequence that means nothing, yeah? it still generated images. And those images were of pretty young white girls. And why did it do that? Because when it didn't know exactly what to produce, it just grabbed the largest part of the data set present, which was back then, obviously, pretty young white girls, right? So definitely a bias. It got better, fortunately. Which brings me to the point that labeling is a political act. Labeling data, yeah, meaning, uh, you know, adding semantic information to a data set, like saying, 
I want to do like a data set of dogs, so I'm going to describe this is a Labrador, this is a, this is a, this is a Chihuahua, and so on. So you label the, 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 the images so that the machine understands what it's seeing. This in itself, on large scale, is a political act because it definitely will uh, push the, the data set towards a specific direction. So which, what is the role now of architects within this whole universe of, of production today? Well, it is an, quite an interesting uh, process to create your own data set. For example, in this case, we created a data set of sections. And we're keen to understand whether the neural network or the AI can produce in any way, shape, or form sections or, or plans that we can use. I was really excited when we had the first results. We was like, oh my god, it totally looks like a section or a plan. I can totally work with that. Yeah. Until you start to look closer and interrogate it a little bit more detail when you figure out that they make no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So uh, they can, I think, uh, provoke you or inspire you as designer and architect to do something unusual and interesting and novel. But there's still work to be done from the human side to add the semantic information in these results. We are working on making it better, I have to admit, in the lab, in, in, uh, at our lab. Yeah. But it is a lot of work. I, I told you before that I wanted to talk a little bit about estrangement and defamiliarization. These are concepts that come from the arts, uh, were basically developed around 100 years ago by people like Viktor Slavsky, and they were used by Bertolt Brecht, and there's a little bit of Sigmund Freud also in there. So estrangement basically assumes or, or proclaims, let me put it as a proclaims, that um, you can take an everyday situation that is familiar to you and add something strange to it to increase the attention of the observer, right? This was used very successfully in theater, for example. Bertolt Brecht is a famous theater uh, director uh, from Germany. He used this method, for example, in his place where he, he made a, a stage design where you saw like a, a wagon that looked like from the 16th century and people cl in clothing of the 16th century. But everything else around it was just a naked stage as it would be normally without a play being played, which provoked the observer or the viewer of the play to understand that the whole situation is artificial. It's synthetic. It's not immersive. So he was not immersive at all. He wanted the people to understand that what they're looking at is a play. Yeah? And to intellectually just listen to what the text is that people are speaking. So in other words, adding something strange to a normal situation will increase the, the attention of the viewer. This is not completely new. Hegel talked about similar ideas. Marx famously talked about the estrangement of the worker. Uh, Viktor Shlovsky I mentioned before, who actually uh, um, wrote a paper in 1907 called um, uh, Estrangement as Effect, I think something like that, and Bertolt Brecht, as I mentioned before. Now, what does Sigmund Freud has to do with this at all? Uh, Sigmund Freud wrote uh, an essay a year after Schlowski called Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny, which talks about the same effect. The effect that when you have a familiar situation, something that you know, something that you are aware of, but there's something strange within that familiarity, it will increase your attention. So both of them came to the same result. Yeah? The, the unheimliche, the uncanny, has a similar effect than estrangement. I'd like to show this image here as an example for that. This is a rather early result from, from mid-journey last year. Um, Every one of you being trained as architects very soon will be very familiar with all the features you see in this image. Horizontal lines, uh, exposed concrete, horizontal window uh, bands, and so on. Like All those things are very, very familiar to every architect, cantilevering, modern looking shapes. Yeah? But nonetheless, something strange is going on in this image. What happened with the relationship to the ground, for example? Is it, is it being carved out of the ground? Is it melting into the ground? Was it damaged? Yeah, same with the roof line. Is it intentionally done like this? Did it, did, you know, was it somehow destroyed or damaged? Is it carved out of one large piece of rock? We don't know. Yeah? But exactly those, st those strange elements is what attracts the attention of the viewer to this image. At least this is my theory, I would say. But what is, what is pretty certain is that this whole method of using artificial intelligence to design in architecture is 
most likely, and I'm pretty convinced about it, the first genuinely 21st century design method in architecture. Because if you think about it, computational methods that we're applying today, all of them, all of them were already developed in the 20th century. They were already being used in the 20th century for a large part. They were polished and, and improved and worked on in the last 20 something years, but they were not really new, right? What we see now with artificial intelligence was not even possible five years ago. Yeah, that's because the algorithms didn't exist, the, the computational power did not exist. So it's really something that genuinely, and also the data sets did not exist. Like things like social media, for example, have made possible to create large scale data sets. Didn't exist before, yeah? So all of these things makes me very, very convinced that this is the first genuinely 21st century design method. A couple of examples. You, I talked a, lot, a bit about theory and the background of the things we're interested in, too, but I would like to show you how we apply it in the design more practically. This is the robot garden. The robot garden was a commission by the robotics department of the University of Michigan who built a new building in the last couple of years called the uh, Ford Robotics Building. And next to the building, they wanted to have a testing ground for their robots, specifically for robots with legs. And more specifically, they want to test their something called the last 100 step problem, which means if, for example, you want to replace uh, Amazon delivery, yeah, Amazon delivery, uh, then the, the most difficult part is from the delivery van to the door of the house, the, the last 100 steps. Uh, so this uh, garden had to have a variety of different ground conditions, gravel, sand, earth, rocks, yeah, and it had to have steps of varying sizes and lengths, yeah. And what we did is we used a, a series of, uh, to, for today's standards, almost primitive methods. It's incredible how fast the whole thing developed forward, yeah. We used deep dreaming, we used style transferring, we used a, a something called 2D to 3D style transferring in this uh, design. And in order to create the, uh, the information necessary to create this pattern on the site, we created a data set of thousands of satellite images with different ground conditions like sand, rocks, gravel, and so on. And then let a, a style gun go over the whole thing. So it was like a whole mashup of different methods. Yeah? We wanted to cramp everything we know into this project somehow, I think. And um, ultimately, the, it, it was successful. The, the garden is getting used like every week, several times. Um, they're, they're, they're very much, the, the project was finished last year. And they're very much looking forward for this winter because one of the features that you don't see here in the video is that there's a water feature in here. You can flood, I don't know if you can see that, maybe I have a uh, laser here, yeah? Here, this here, you can flood that with water. So you can, uh, you, you, you open a valve, there's water, and you can overflow the whole thing. So there's, there's, they're waiting for winter to create icy steps and icy ground, yeah? to get the robot to try to walk over that and see if, the, if, it can, if it can handle it. Of course, you can also apply it to a variety of different scales. Uh, this is actually a, 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 um, um, a style gun animation that we did using the um, satellite images for the robot garden. And this is how such a data set actually partially looks like. It's, it's only a small part of it. Uh, what, what we know, or what the computer science friends told me, or colleagues told me, is that um, you need at least around 1,500 images in a data set to get it to work somehow. Yeah? More is always better. Less is problematic. Yeah? However, funny enough, we figured out that you can also use that uh, problem to your advantage. That's, by the way, a very human thing. Um, the, the, the ability to see a problem and figure out like, wait a second, that actually, if I, I could use that, I can do something with that. That's a very human trait that AI, by the way, has not solved yet. They don't know how to do that. And we did it. We actually reduced the amount of data, we starved the, data, we starved the algorithm, so to speak, to figure out if it does something weird or different or strange, and it absolutely did. It did things like this. I really like this image. It's, it's, uh, uh, you, have to cons you have to think that the robot garden is actually um, a piece of architecture made by machines for machines, right? Because it's actually not supposed to be for humans. It's just for robots, right? It's a robot garden 
that's what it's called. Uh, and this one I like also because I, I always have the feeling, I think that the that machines think this is architecture. Yeah, it's not usable for humans, but maybe for them, I don't know. Could be interesting. The project was several times on show. Um, Sarah mentioned the, the Biennale in, in Vienna and the Biennale in, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. That's where it was on show there several times. It was published in the meantime also in AD. Yes, it was in, it was in AD in, the, in one uh, recent one. Uh, and it was on show in Venice. Okay, so this is basically, the, all the things that you saw now, they all happened before Mid Journey came along, yeah? And I remember using the first um, like diffusion models, so image generators. Uh, it was, there was one called Disco Diffusion, which was before Mid Journey came out, and I thought already, okay, this is really interesting, something's gonna happen here. And then very quickly we came to this point, um, where it became completely clear that it has reached mainstream. And I was actually quite happy about that because I thought that uh, if, 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 if millions of architects pick this up because they see it and see like, oh wow, I can actually do something quickly and cool and fun with it and let's, let me try it. If millions of architects pick it up and only a couple of thousand are left after two years or so really interested in, in pursuing what we can do with AI beyond the image generators, we have a really interesting conversation in the discipline, and I think that's going to happen. It's already it's already noticeable. Uh, I always like to show this this quote when it comes to image generators based on language. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. It's very true. Even if you're using blending tools or other tools in in, in image generators, what is meant here by language is really the ability of the architect to to take all the knowledge that they have accumulated over their career as students, as, as practitioners, and so on, and apply that to, a, to an algorithm that is, is, is able to visualize those. I'll show you a very early example of, of image generator-based design. So this is a project from 2020 where we used um, um, an attentional generative adversarial network um, to do that, that's a, that's like the this is like the grandfather of Mid Journey, so to speak, yeah, or the great grandfather of Mid Journey. Um, it was based on a on the so-called Coco dataset, uh, uh, um, uh, common objects in common environments, or something like that, Coco. And um, and uh, um, an algorithm that was developed actually at the time by our, by our colleagues at uh, Robotics. So you see that that's what the image generator was doing based on our prompts at the time. It was not even similar to, to anything, right? It was just weird patterns and colors and I don't know what. But it was still for us usable as a starting point for the design because we took those patterns and those objects that came out from this text-based image generator and translated the color patches into three-dimensional volumes. Quite primitively, actually, yeah? But it was, as I say, it was like first attempt trying to figure out, okay, can we use this weird AI stuff really as, an, as a generator for design? And one thing we figured out very quickly also was that they can provide us with something that happens on the outside of the building, but they cannot really inform what's going on inside the building. Yeah? Uh, so we had to basically do all, whatever was going on in terms of program inside those volumes, we had to do per hand, basically, yeah? In the meantime, we have better methods. I mean, this was 2020, and as I told you, like in three years, so much happened that it's, it's, it's crazy. The next image generator that I found out about was Disco Diffusion. This is a Disco Diffusion example that I did uh, January last year. Um, and I was also kind of, and it, 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 it really exploded into the architecture scene very quickly. And I was wondering what makes this so attractive to architects? What makes this generator so attractive? And I think one answer may, may lie in the, in the tendency um, or tradition, I would say, of architects to work through variation. Yeah? So this is an example from the atelier Hans Hollen of 26, I think, uh, different uh, volumetric models made in the office looking for the one variation that will give us the, the result for the design. And this is something that Hollen's office always did. I worked for, the, for him for years. 
this was always how we began, like variations, 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 and then find the one that really will create a solution that is viable. Uh, and you, if you think about it, I think every architect has that. What MidJourney does and image generators do is they amplify that. They amplify it very quickly. So I'm, this, I did, this is an older calculation that I did, but from April last year to around August last year, I generated 125,000 images. Yeah? And I'm not even a power user. There were people who actually did even more, way more. Yeah? Uh, and so it, what, I, what you saw with this concept of variations in architecture gets just amplified and speed up with this new process. This is um, uh, basically an artwork that we did for an exhibition in Vienna that just closed, um, which was um, uh, a mosaic made of, I think, 25,000 uh, AI-generated images. Yeah? Uh, so when you get closer to the image, you will see that it's actually lots of small images, yeah? which is basically to demonstrate like this, this abundancy of creativity that somehow, this explosion of creativity that those tools actually allow. How, now again, sorry for something a little bit technical now, but uh, how do, do these diffusion models actually work and how, they, how did they come to be? What's the ontology of those things? It actually all started in 2015 uh, when there was enough annotated images around that somebody came up with the clever idea that you can automatically label images. Meaning you show, them, you show an image to an, to an algorithm and it will give you a caption for that image automatically. So for example, in this case, it was recognizing these different features on the bridge yeah? and it automatically created the caption, people walking on a bridge because it recognized that people walking on a bridge. Now somebody at the time came up with the brilliant idea and said like, what happens if you turn it around? What happens if I write something and let it generate the image? Because it understands now the different parts, no? So basically I, I write people walking on a bridge and I should get then this image, right? That was the idea. The person who came up with that was Elman Mansinov uh, at Amazon's web service. And of course, very quickly, they created a paper. Yeah? That's the way how you make sure that people have to quote you when you come up with something. Highly recommended to you, every one of you. You want to become famous, write a lot of papers. <laughs> OK. Um, so he, the, the paper was called Generating Images from Captions with Attention. And that was in 2016. And in that paper, these are the first images that they generated, and it says, a stop sign is flying in the blue skies, is the first on the left. A herd of elephants flying in the blue skies. A toilet seat sits open in the grass field and a person skiing on a sand clad vast desert. So these were in the paper, by the way. Yeah? I'm not making this up. These were in the paper. And you see, I mean, you barely can recognize what it's supposed to be. Only, I mean, if you read the caption, you're like, ah, okay, that's supposed to be a, a, a stop sign flying in the blue sky. Yeah, I see it now, yeah. So basically what happens in the process of doing this is that the diffusion models, they take the data, they basically scramble them yeah, to the point where it's only noise. So they add noise and add noise and add noise and it, until it's only noise, yeah, pixels. And then they take this scrambled data, this noise, and denoise it and denoise it and denoise it according to your prompt, thus generating an image out of them. Yeah? So it becomes less and less and less until it's, it's, it's an image. Um, this is possible only because of the, the as, I'm, as I'm saying, those things are just possible because of the technology we have now and the algorithms we have now. There's two very specific things that are uh, really crucial in creating these images. On, number one is the so-called Markov chain the, the denoising happens along the Markov chain. And secondly, we have transformers. Transformers is a fairly new invention in AI research, which basically allows you to, to, to run this process not just one time, like it was traditionally done in neural networks. You had one neural network. No, you have like multiple of those parallel to each other. That's possible by doing, using transformers which allows you to go through the process much, much faster. That's why MidJourney came up with an image in a couple of seconds. Otherwise, it would not be possible. Yeah? So I'm sorry for the technological part here, but I think it's important for you to understand that it's not magic. 
it's, I have, I, when I talk to my students, I, I, I pester them with this. It's just a technology. And the more you know about it, the more you demystify it. Yeah? Of course, this new technology has these dark sides, right? You prompt it to say, like, do a mise on the road building, and it will give you a fairly good result. And, and this is, by the way, using an older version of Midjourney, what you see here. The newer one is even better than that, which, of course, opens every door to lazy architects. Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah? So, yes, we will see copies of stuff. Well, not really copies, because it's not a copy, re -imagine, synthetic imaginations of existing architecture. And I cannot see one more bad Zaha copy in the, one of those uh, uh, forums around. It's just horrible, yeah? Poor Zaha, she doesn't deserve that. <laughs> okay, so what, what happens if you do something like a section drawing through an opera house? And here we come back to this whole concept of estrangement. Funny enough, the earlier versions of Mid Journey were very prone to hallucinating things, yeah? So you, you created a section through an opera house and you got things like this, yeah? Yeah, it's fairly interesting. It's not a section through an opera house, but I can see it turns, you know, with a little bit of elbow grease becoming an opera house, yeah? So yeah, that's a nice inspiration. Now you take a newer one and the newer versions of Mid Journey have this tendency to become more realistic, yeah? Which means you do the same prompt and you get things like this. The Disneyfication of an opera house, I would say, yeah? So it's, it's, it's not interesting, I think at least. I mean, it's, yeah, it's an illustration, it's not a section. The other one is least a form of section. This is not a section. Blueprint, it got blueprint somehow, yeah, from the prompt, it seems. But not that interesting. But what if you prompted the most beautiful house in the world? Yeah, so this is Mid Journey version two. We are at 5.2 at the moment, by the way. So this is version two, the result from version two. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, it's a white elephant with hair. <laughs> um, okay, now the same thing, the same prompt, the most beautiful house in the world with Mid Journey four. I have to try this with the newest version, but with Mid Journey version four, Guess what you get is the most beautiful house in the world. Anyone can guess? So I like to show these images in, in lectures in architecture schools because I can tell you, yes, architects will be needed in the future. <laughs> yes? So we're not gonna get, we're not gonna lose our jobs to AI. Trust me, not gonna happen. But it does really fairly interesting things. Like these ones, for example, for me were really, uh, it, it is, by the way, totally dependent on your ability to use the technology, because you can do also cool things with it if you like, if you want to. But these ones, for example, were literally used by our office as starting point for sections for our project. Yeah? But as I say, and that's the important term, starting, what, well, two terms, starting point. Yeah? Where you start, you get inspired, you, you see like something interesting in there. It's not really creating a section at the moment, at least not. So how do we get those things into 3D? Because that's the next problem, right? Uh, this is um, a, a project that we did for um, uh, the so-called Generali Center in Vienna on the Maria it's a It's a combination between shopping mall, offices, and apartments. And uh, so we created a data set of brutalist architecture. Uh, we could, we, and by the way, you, you have to learn how to scrape. I would recommend that, yeah. Scraping means automatically searching the internet for images that you want to use in your data set. Then we trained it on this data set and created some interesting results. We created a latent walk. This is these animations that you also saw already before with several other projects. And then from these latent walks, we selected um, a couple of slides, I would say, that we used then in a so-called pixel projection to create a 3D model out of them. It's a primitive method. Still, like a lot of the things in AI in terms of getting things done right now are rather straightforward and primitive, not as sophisticated as a lot of people think, but we get things done. So we, we created this 3D model out of it and then um, applied that to um, the site and, and then the real work started. Because again, yes, you get like an inspirational, interesting model, but where are my floors really? Where's my elevators? Where's my staircases? Where's my toilets? Yeah, you don't get this out of this, 
right away. You have to put this work in there, right? Um, but it's really, f uh, for me, what was sort of entertaining about this result is that it, it doesn't look like any common brutalism <laughs> building, but it still has its DNA, right? It still has this sort of concrete, heavy, you know, chunky feel to it, yeah? Uh, and that's what I mean by using like existing data, for example, looking into the latent space, and this is where we are with the latent space that is supposed to be part of this lecture. The latent space is the space between the existing data points that shows you things that you might normally not see. In, in this extent, the, the, those machines like latent walks and so on allow, are similar to microscopes or telescopes. They allow you as a human to see things that you normally wouldn't see so easily. And that means here also in terms of creativity. You see areas of creativity that were hidden to us so far but you also have to have the human intuition to be able to use them, yeah? <coughs> to, to understand that that's something that is a, is a positive. This, in this slide, like all the things that we are pulled out of this model are things that we had to do manually to make this project work. So you see how much manual work is still involved in this. Uh, this was a, is, is a fun commission. It's, it's a house for a, neuro, for a neurologist in Austria. He read about uh, what we're working on in terms of AI. And because, of course, um, AI is profoundly influenced by neuroscience, he was fascinated or he was like, interested in the idea to say, like, OK, I would like to have a house that is based on my expertise right? as, as neurologist. But he made, a, he, made one, he made one condition. He said, but the house had to, has to be a mid-century modern house. All right, good. Well, we have said fine. Yeah, uh, we again we tra we 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 data data set of elevations of mid-century houses and plans of mid-century houses. Collected thousands of these images, created the data set, made again a latent walk, trained the network on it. Yeah, basically using the same method that I showed before for the previous project, and then we we you know we did the pixel projection and everything, um, and that's the result. That's on the site. Yeah, and. It's actually quite, again, it has those features of mid-century modern houses, but at the same time, it's doing things that a mid-century modern architect would have never done because it's not practical. Yeah, so it's not very modern in that sense. Yeah? Like, for example, these kind of strange blocks in the facade that I'm not entirely even sure what they are. They're probably going to become uh, um, shelves or wardrobes or something, like in, in George Nelson tradition. Uh, but it's, um, it was also for the owner, uh, for the who commissioned the house, quite um, an in, a good result. So he likes it. We're gonna, uh, if everything goes to plan, we're gonna start construction in spring. And then very recently, uh, we we built the dog house. So uh, first image is a mid center is a is a mid journey image, first to the left. The middle one is basically an abstraction of that because we figured out that this whole pixel projection method that we use works better when the images are very contrast. When they have high contrast, it works better. So we really made it, made it black and white. And then to the, to the right, you see the finished project. Uh, it was uh, fabricated in Austria. Um, it was just much easier to get it done in Austria than ship it over from here. It's just, just a practical thing. Uh, these are all the individual parts of it the renderings, and then a video of the setup in the Mac in Vienna. It was set up fairly quickly, like I think it needed three days for, uh, to set up everything. And that's the finished piece. We also had uh, a couple of Ibo robots because it's a doghouse, right? So we had we 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 got a couple of Ibo robots and put them in there so that they walk around and play with people and so on. It's a doghouse, of course. It needs dogs. The Boston Dynamics were a bit too expensive, and we would have had to do a, a, a much bigger house, I think. Next time, exactly. So here he is like playing with somebody. Apart from all this work, like you know, publishing and lecturing about AI, I also founded the Neural Architecture Group, which is a group of architects interested in 
uh, in similar topics and ideas and concepts like um, Daniel Polohan, Emmanuel Co, Sandra Manninger, and myself. In the meantime, we have a couple of others uh, who became members. Uh, there is the website aiarchitects.org, uh, which collects pos different positions uh, on, on how to use artificial intelligence in architecture. Come, come regularly back to the website because we're adding more and more people. It, they're becoming more people now, which is great. I mean, at the beginning we, were, we had a hard time finding anyone. Now, yeah, people are coming, which is great. Uh, and of course, the ARI Laboratory, the Ar Laboratory for Architecture and Artificial Intelligence at Taubman College, um, where we are we're doing actually research that we, we cannot do with students in one semester. It, it's just, it's just, it, that's why we made the lab. The lab needs to have like a, a longer trajectory to, for example, create um, plan generators that are, that are based on uh, apartment plans labeled from all around the world. So we're really trying to get people from all around the world to label these plans. And the goal at the end is, for example, to provide architects with a tool that allows them to optimize social housing, for example. Yeah? Uh, so th that basically by learning all those plans, it will allow us to, to, to create better living conditions for a lot of people. This is, for me, this is the main goal of using these tools. It's, yes, it is a fun tool. It's, 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 you can do like a, a, enormous ideas in terms of culture and philosophy and concepts. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's also the practical application of these tools that, m that might, and I'm convinced it will, help um, improve the living conditions of millions of people, maybe billions of people around the world. This is the website of the, of the ARI laboratory. I'm sorry we haven't updated it in a while. We're busy, okay? <laughs> so, um, and there is the, the YouTube channel, um, remeshing-ai, where you can uh, there's my lectures and a bunch of tutorials uh, also for Python and also how to install a variety of different, like how do you uh, install Anaconda, which you need actually f to run, for example, scraping on your computer and things like that. So there's practical things on the, on, the, on the YouTube channel, but also the lectures. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, wait a second. Yeah, no, no. I, I have to do like the, the, the shameless plug here. <laughs> so this is my book, Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence. I highly recommend it to everyone here in the lecture to check it out. Um, you should have it in the library, by the way. I mean, I don't know. And, um, but this is not the only one. There's also um, Machine Hallucinations. That's an AD that came out last year. Uh, that was edited together. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> was edited together with uh, Neil Leach uh, that collects a variety of different positions on AI and architecture design. This fall, hopefully, finally, uh, the book Diffusions will come out. Diffusions in, in Architecture, which is a collection of 20 architects discussing the use of Midjourney and Dali and all those things. And it includes also a, a couple of theorists like Mario Carpo, um, Lev Menovich uh, wrote the preface. Um, Bart Lotzma, uh, Joy Knoblauch, they all uh, contributed to the, the, the concept, conceptual idea behind using diffusion models. So this is gonna be hopefully out. It's finished, so it should come out soon. And right now I'm working on the next AD about uh, artificial intelligence in architecture, which ca will come out um, next spring. So I'm sorry for the shameless plug, but hey, I have to do that. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. I hope you have some good questions. That was fantastic. Uh, we do have time for questions. Oh, <laughs> wake up. I'll, I'll come to you, Tammy. Thank you for that. It was fascinating. You you talked about how you know there continues to be a need for human architects because the fine details aren't there, like toilets and and these sorts of things. Do you envision as the machine learning learns more that those things would be included versus you know kind of a more general exterior, even with the um, us being able to see the interior? Actually, yes. 
I think this is going to be fairly quick. It's going to be fairly quick to, uh, to, to add this. I mean, there are several people working on this already. Um, but uh, from my experience, what I, what I learned is what um, none of these machines learning things can do are um, things like human intuition. Like, for example, deciding that, yes, logically, the toilet should be there. But in fact, it's not good that it's there because it's in the way of a view or a specific way of you, how you want to make the room and so on. Like this, this f form of sensibility of space, for example, right, is something that machine learning m cannot do yet. Yeah, it might do that at some point when it learns enough, but um, until then, there's probably some time. That, uh, this, it, this is going to take time. It's nothing that's going to go fast, I think. But I was wrong already with that one. So. <laughs> a fascinating lecture. Thank you for presenting it. Um, my question really comes into how much of your AI models have you used existing AI work to train your AI models? And what were the outcomes that resulted from that? Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. So this is something that happens fairly, fairly often in my studio when I teach AI because it, for example, to really create your own algorithm and your own data set and train it and so on, it sometimes takes a lot of time. You cannot do that in a semester with students, so they have to rely on existing data sets and existing algorithms and existing... Um, I mean, for, this, for example, on Google Colab, there's like a lot of finished algorithms that people have put there for, for another purpose, right? I don't know, to create images of horses, I don't know, yeah? But you can use the same algorithm and tweak it a little bit and just tie it to another data set and you have a tool that you can use as an architect. So right now I think it's a lot about human creativity and imagination of how to use actually tools that were designed for something else for our own purposes as designers. Does that make sense? I think, well, to, to, to add on, uh, sorry, to, to clarify a little bit, the actual imagery that you're using for your yep. data sets, not necessarily the algorithms. What happens when we start training AI on AI? like the, the data ah. sets that are generated from an, for an AI project, suddenly you're training it on previous AI-generated yeah. assets. Yeah, you're talking about data set pollution. That's what it's called. Yeah, no, it's, it's true, it's, it's called data set pollution. Um, I've done something like that, maybe not with an entirely AI-generated data set, but uh, in, my, in my experience, the, the results become just messy and blurry. It's, it's, dil it's diluting, I think it's diluting the data because it's, it's not anymore that organic data that you were supposed to work with, but it's synthetic data. But I also have to say that there's a whole field in computer science at the moment dedicated to synthetic data, like because we, for certain areas we don't have enough uh, data to get things running, so we have to artificially in increase those. And those results are fairly good, yeah. Uh, yes, it was very fascinating, for sure. Um, when you first said, what would be a beautiful house, and you put up the, quote, beautiful house, and it seemed like everyone in this room would said, boy, that's just awful. Would there ever come a point in time where uh, artificial intelligence would input, let's say, what the architect feels in passing judgment over what is beautiful? I mean, I think this is pretty unfair for me what I showed there, these images, because in fact, what is a beautiful house, generally speaking, anyways, right? There's like, a, there's a million different opinions about that. So I don't think there's a general, you cannot generalize the beautiful house anyways. This more, was more like a joke, yeah? But I have to tell you that what you just said makes sense because if I, as an architect, yeah, define very specifically what I consider beautiful, what I consider aesthetical, which you would do by selecting specific images for a data set, for example. You, you select all those. Then you can really specify it into a direction that will be um, sufficient for you. Or that will make you, that, I, I don't know, make you happy is maybe the wrong word, but it will definitely uh, comply with your aesthetic standards. Yes, you can do that. Yes, absolutely. There's architecture companies out there, for example, who are creating their, their own like they're, they're using their own data set, they're using their own imagery that they've created, I, companies that are like 40, 50 years old, who have a lot of output 
created. They use all those images, they put it into a data set, and then they can actually output new designs that are similar to things they've done in the past already. I like the, well, and maybe I'll pick up on Steve's question. I like the way that you talked about, I think it was the estrangement or the, the way that we make the images more strange, which maybe also ties back to the question about maybe what we think is beautiful versus yep. beauty. Um, and I've even started to play, like go back and resource and blend my V3 images now with V5 to try and get to some of that. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility, are you working on a, an estrangement algorithm potentially where we could, because I think what we see is mid journeys moving, like you talked about it, more and more photorealistic, right? We get something that, that exists, but we actually like the space that's maybe more of a sketch, more abstract, not quite resolved yet, and having to work through it. I mean, is there some sense about, I don't, I don't think that we should dial back maybe the algorithm, but advance the algorithm, but also find ways that we might get more abstraction from that, as opposed to th this rush to photorealism. Right. I think there's two possible ways to answer this. Like, number one is that you still can use V3, right? I mean, you just dash dash V3 and you have you use V3. Uh, or V2, whichever older version you want to use of Midjourney. But more interesting to me is when this is done a little bit more conscious. And to do this, it's probably still better to use things like Stylegun 2 and Latin Walks and things like that, which are still are out there. And just because Midjourney has like basically like covered everything up, yeah, it doesn't mean that you cannot use that anymore. So I use, I still use Stylegun quite a lot. Like for example, the the, the generally project and the deep house were both done with Stylegun 2, not with Midjourney. The only project that was done with Midjourney was the dog house. Uh, that's the only one. Uh, and the the, um, the 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 generally and as, as well as the deep house both have those estrangement elements in there that like a little bit weird and different, but still familiar enough to be considered. Yes, it's still a house, and I can see it as a sort of it has that. DNA of a mid-century modern house, but I still also I see the strange parts too, right? So, uh, and I appreciate when, when people want to push it in the direction of estrangement because I think it's a very interesting area of, of interrogation, specifically when it comes to novel aesthetic possibilities for every field. Like, look what they did in, in, in the visual arts with that idea. It's a fantastic, yeah? Sophia Crespo's work is a, a beautiful example, for example, about estrangement of, of deep sea creatures. Beautiful, yeah? So earlier you were speaking about the possible existence of Egyptian spirits. So earlier you were talking about the possible racial or gender bias based on AI. When it comes to making buildings, is it possible for the algorithm to have a bias based on the overall demographic in the area it's building, say it were to build a build to design a building to be in California versus a building meant to be in Brooklyn, New York, what would be the difference in designing based on the people there? Would mm -hmm. it make them equally and try to have the same quality for everyone, or would it possibly change the quality based on who the main people in that area are? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it, it it all starts and ends with the data. That's what I always tell people. It's, it's, this is what, what informs the algorithm and informs the design later. So if you use the same data set in Los Angeles or New York, you will probably get the same results in both areas. And they will be probably quite generalistic, not very specifically designed for a certain population. But if you start to create a data set that answers to specific needs of a population, yeah, do you understand what I mean? Then it can very specifically address that to a certain population, let's say in Los Angeles or in New York, and they will be different. The results will be different. Yeah? Again, it's all in the data. You, if, you, if you use the right data, you will get a well-informed, good design. If you use the wrong data, you will get something which is international style, like you know, trying to get everything done with one ruler, which is not the way the world works, in my opinion, at least. Does it make sense? over here. Um, in both your fine art examples and your architecture examples, you are essentially doing sampling. I mean, there's a 
process of sampling. And we know in, in um, intellectual property rights, there's some encroachment where you know, the law is on the side of the, the originator, and then sometimes it's not. Can you talk about that and what yes. you've done in your, in your process to avoid such conflicts? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question also, thank you very much. So uh, there is a difference between sampling and the form of generation that happens now with these tools. Sampling, similar to collage, yeah, uh, you can re rec still recognize the origin of where this came from. You c in, in a sampled song, for example, you still can, even if it's a short sample, a well-informed person can tell you that this comes from James Brown, 1967, this on this record, right? So it, the origin of that can be traced back very clearly. Yeah? Same with collage, right? Oh, this is a piece of, uh, from a newspaper from that date that was published in Paris in 1908 when, when Picasso just picked it up and glued it on a piece of paper. With this, with this what is happening here, you cannot, it's, not, it's not that, because um, the results, whatever you get as results, you, you saw that I explained that it actually makes noise out of it, and then the, the noise gets denoised to become a new image. So the original data at some point in that process is going through that, but the end result cannot be traced back anymore. I cannot say that's actually a part of uh, a Miss van der Rohe building that was, you know, you cannot trace it back. And because of that, this whole uh, legal thing is different to sampling. Uh, so, um, uh, that's also why I think that all those artists who are suing now different companies that are doing this have no chance whatsoever. Yeah? They have to start to understand that we're living in a world with, where those kind of standards uh, of, um, of copyright are very much in question at the moment. I'm not a lawyer, I have no answer to it, yeah? but I know that lawyers will have, a hard, will have some time now in trying to figure out how to do that. How do you trace back a single pixel? Yeah. Yes, the lawyers can get involved, but in your own consciousness, yeah. can you, you know, where do you draw a line where it's scram where yeah. you're unscrambling the, the data and yeah. making it your own original? So what, one thing that I, I really like to do is, for example, to avoid imprompting names of living architects or artists. Yeah? Because I think that's kind of unfair to sort of imitate their work. I'm far more interested in, instead of imitating, because this is one of the things that they teach you when you start working with diffusion models. Like the first uh, tutorial is absolutely, yes, and you write the name of this artist and that artist is gonna do something really cool, yeah? Yeah, it's true, but what if you don't want to copy the style of an artist or the, the way of an architect, but rather a concept, right? Like how do you describe a concept without describing or using a name or a style, yeah? Uh, and those things are really interesting because it forces you to think differently about the way how you prompt those machines. One thing that, though, I have to admit one thing that I still do is I like, for example, to use the name of a specific photographer or something, just to get like a certain visual direction. Yeah, but not necessarily the, 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 the content. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Matthias. I. I, as you were talking, I had particular critiques as you were going along that you addressed. So first, the first one was quantity versus quality, right? And then you talked about the role of iteration in architectural design. And then it was about sensibility, right? And we looked at the different forms of what is the most beautiful house. And then uh, it then to me was, okay, well, novel methods of utilizing artificial intelligence. But then you provided a website where you can one, go to and see what conversations are already being had, but potentially also offer to that conversation. So I don't want to use this question because there's okay. a space for that. So I want to talk a little bit about what Carl mentioned about estrangement, because I feel like um, it's right now you're using it as a means of making the decision of when to publish something. It's strange enough, I can put it on my website. So, but I want to say, you know, when Brecht was working, the rate of production of cultural artifacts was much slower. Mm -hmm. And so what was strange and what was defamiliar was important. But to also create something that is defamiliar, you must first understand the familiar and then move away from the familiar. And so th I think this is a question on teaching about the role of estrangement, the role of defamiliarization, whether in an undergrad portion, a grad portion, 
where they are in a person's education. But I want to say this. If you ever really focus on people who are producing content for something like TikTok, there's somebody who uh, says, this is how you create an Italian sauce. It's onion and it's tomato sauce only. OK. And salt. <laughs> and then the person says, I'm going to recreate this video. And what they do is they purposefully use a red onion, because they know that if they use a red onion, it's going to set the Italian community on fire. <laughs> yeah? OK, yeah. Gotcha. But this is a form in and of itself of estrangement, of defamiliarization, mm -hmm. because then what happens is they're going to say, uh, their, their comment section is going to go off. So they're going to manipulate the algorithm through estrangement. At some point when, and excuse me, I'm sorry if you're a suburban house mom, but I often use this cliche of the suburban house mom. When the suburban house mom is now utilizing estrangement as a method for their creativity, is estrangement and defamiliarization enough at the level of trying to create something important in the world like architecture? <laughs> There's more to talk about yeah. in AI. But yeah, no, I, I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, I mean, I, the one point is really important that you said that defamiliarization only works if you, are, if you know what defamiliar is. I get it. And the reason why I also brought this topic into this whole AI discussion was because what, uh, what a lot of neural networks do a priori is feature recognition, right? They have to recognize things that are familiar. Right? That's how a car recognizes who's a pedestrian, what's a bicycle, what's the sidewalk, and so on. Right? So he, he recognizes familiar aspects of our environment in order to respond to it. Right? When, you, when you throw those networks off intentionally, unintentionally, by underfitting, for example, things like that, the result starts to still have features that are familiar to us, but because it's thrown off, it starts to hallucinate things that are strange to us as humans, right? This is the reason why I actually ad, like, took this on. I was like, OK, this is it's very, very similar to what Sigmund Freud described, what Schlossky described, as you know, taking something that is familiar and adding enough estrangement to it that becomes interesting. I agree with you. Yes, this is a method that get, gets used in social media a lot. Funny enough, but the, the thing is that I, I have not seen yet a profound discussion on that effect that you described, maybe in a TikTok video where somebody says estrangement is this or that. I don't know. I don't watch this. I don't. I don't have TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what I mean is that that you, you you need to create an intellectual basis to discuss effects that you're seeing produced by a technology, right? And my cho my my what I chose was estrangement because I thought that's something that really happens in the technology a lot. That's the only reason I'm doing that. Not because I think it's, it will trend or, or be, I, I don't care actually about that too much. Yeah. Yes, I have an Instagram page, but that's about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think the question then becomes as a designer, how do you, so sorry. The question then becomes as a designer, to what degree of estrangement is most productive? Yes, I agree, absolutely, yes. Because you can overdo it too, and then it's useless. Wonderful lecture. Um, and the use of AI, um, would it go into different professions? Like, let's say, um, the doctor profession? Mm -hmm. How would that um, happen, if yep. that makes sense? That's already happening. Actually, they were f before the architects and before the artists. So for example, in medicine, uh, there, there was very interesting research on using neural networks to, we talked about feature recognition right before, like that it can, you know, the car can recognize the pedestrian and so on. But for example, there was a very interesting, and it's, I think it's used now generally, where a neural network was trained to recognize breast cancer. Yeah? Because you have like millions and millions of mammograms, right? And so you can train a machine to really differentiate between healthy uh, uh, tissue and uh, cancer. Uh, Cancerous tissue, yeah? Uh, so this is, for example, one example how it's used in, in diagnostics in medicine. And it's and this is just one example of many. By now, they're like really getting more and more into this because especially diagnostics in medicine can benefit from this enormously. Mistakes are getting less. And it seems like the best result, 99% of, uh, so 99% certainty in the diagnosis is achieved when they work together. When you have an AI doing feature recognition, saying here's something off, 
and you have a medical doctor proofing, like looking at it and says, yes, that's a problem. That's the highest rate of, of, uh, uh, of certainty. And in any other fields, like every field, for example, that previously had to memorize things yeah, is affected by this. Lawyers, for example, they're, they're, they're having like a hard time now because AI is much better in finding, for example, the, the, the case that they want to, to, to make and things like that. So it's, I've, I've, I've read things like that even burger flippers would be affected by this. So um, it's gonna affect every discipline in some way, shape or form. Uh, I can ask one last question, I think. I walked through the room, there are no more questions, but there's um, one aspect that I would ask you to help me understand. Because uh, in the computational realm, we use seed values a lot, even if we think about randomization functions in Grasshopper, but also these kind of tools use random seeds. Mm -hmm. and, and since we have talked about uh, quality through quantity, that kind of quantity gets generated in a way randomly. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, that paired with the fact that by definition, text to image AI, for instance, is derivative, see, as you have beautifully explained earlier. So how do you react to those kind of claims that talk about AI as something random and derivative? So how you... <laughs> uh, address those things in a good, positive Good question. I mean, I think that people that think that might use AI wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I mean, it's, it, you know, there's two things that AI can do profoundly well, right? It's prediction and optimization. This is the two things that it can do really, and all the things that I showed today are based on these two, two things, not more than that, yeah? So uh, once you understand that, this question becomes obsolete because if, if, if prediction, yes, prediction can be random if you, if, you, if you program it wrong, absolutely. Optimization can go wrong if you put input the wrong numbers or have the wrong data. So again, it comes back to the whole thing I, th I mentioned before, it's all in the data, yeah? If you have the wrong data, you will get wrong like random results, yeah? If you know which data you're using and why you're using it and which algorithm can provide you the best result, you will get something that is useful. Let me put it this way. I hope this helps. Oh, no, yeah, that yeah. was great. And I want to thank you again. There's one thing from your presentation I want to pick on and to reiterate to this cohort of students, you know, think about language as an entity that defines the boundaries of your world and translate that into culture because the more things you know, the more architects you study, you know, the more like you start to collect your own database of information, the more you'll have great results when it comes to design outcomes. So keep that in mind, keep studying, building your culture, that's the right moment to do so. So thank you again for today, it was fantastic. And congratulations. <laughs>